everybody. Welcome to the UNCA Creative Writing Faculty Reading. Thanks for coming on this beautiful sunny day. You could be doing other things like looking at the beautiful leaves, which you can do right after. Um, I'm Lori Horvitz, and I will be reading, but we'll also hear from, in this order, Mildred Barya, Wiley Cash, Rick Chess, Evan Gurney, David Hopes, and myself, Lori Horvitz. So without further ado, um, here's Mildred Barya. Okay, it's exciting to see all of you, and thanks for coming. My name is Mildred Barya. I'm currently teaching intro to creative writing. Let me see if I can see my students here. Okay, just to, yeah, great. Okay, we have a representative. And it's exciting to be part of this reading. So, and right now in this second, you can tell that I'm trying to decide what to read. Okay. All right, some of these are from my dreams. I've been telling my students that I dream a lot. And because of that, I decided to start using my dreams as part of my writing. And some of these are travel pieces, travel hybrids or narratives. So they happened on the road or somewhere. And some of these are just imagined pieces. So I'll leave it to you to decide which one is a dream, which one is real, which one is lived experience, and which one is not any of the three that I've mentioned. OK. The movement of bodies. My body was buried without a heart. Having donated it along with a left kidney and brain to the state. But I feel whole. I am kept busy with new arrivals. My job is to welcome them. Tell them to feel at home. Forget what they say about St. Peter minding that door. He is never here. I do not know who I am exactly. I wear a purple gown with buttons in front. When it gets hot, I unbutton. In a corner lies a bundle of beautiful clothes I was buried in, a green scarf, a beige dress, and white shoes. I remember owning the dress and scarf, but not the shoes. Since I stay on my feet a lot, I wear Vibram five fingers. They are comfortable. There is plenty of dust and no mirrors in this place. I would like to tell you about the others, what they do and say, but I don't hear a thing besides the swinging door. I stand in the doorway, say welcome, hand the new arrivals a change of clothes, which are mysteriously placed in my arms by I don't know who, then I step aside and let them enter where they disappear into the great hall. As they move, I see fog appearing suddenly and swallowing them. Hot or cold, fog is here. My next piece is in Birmingham, Alabama. For some inexplicable reason, stray dogs, cats, and elderly women with dementia follow me. Sometimes they walk with me to lead them home. One I give a scarf because she's shivering, it's April, cold, and she has no sweater. She's in a sleeveless flowing dress and talks excitedly with nervous energy. She talks to me about bread, how I still bake the best bread. I cook a lot, but I've never baked anything, not at this time. She makes mention of my mouth-watering bread numerous times, but cannot answer where she lives. I take her hand and tell her where to cross the road to a cafe in sight. She says, let's do it. With my free hand, I dial 911 because I do not know who else to call. A man responds, and I describe the cafe and street address. We go inside and sit. The lady is still talking, which helps. Eventually, the police officer finds us and starts asking the lady where she lives, if she has relatives, 
numbers one can call, more bread talk. Then he asks her for her social security number. At that point, I'm like, surely, dude, she hasn't so far been able to mention a house number. And you think she remembers her SSN? To my surprise, she knows her SSN. The officer calls his office and someone runs the number and lo, the lady lives in a senior residence about 60 blocks from where we are, has a daughter that the officer calls and discovers the lady has been missing for four hours. The daughter agrees to come and pick her up. At that point, I ask the officer if I can leave while he waits with the lady and he says I can, all is well. I almost tear up when I say goodbye to the lady. She's so small and cheerful. I pray that she remains safe in all her wanderings. On another day, I'm waiting at the traffic lights near my school when a dog crosses the road and waits with me. I move away and the dog moves towards me. It is 1.15 p.m. and my class will be starting at 1.30 p.m. I arrive at the school with a dog and ask the lady at the front desk what I should do. She looks up the animal help number, but nobody answers when I call. The next number she finds is in another town and someone responds. I tell the person that I have a dog whose name I do not know. It just followed me to school, has no tag, and could she please come pick it up? My class will be starting in two minutes, and I cannot stay with the dog. So far it's been calm, but who knows what it might do if I go with it to my students. Won't I be exposing them to danger? The front desk lady doesn't want the dog to proceed to class. I open the front door, the dog hastens to my side, and we step outside. Then, alone, I walk back into the building. Through the glassy door, the dog looks at me. I look in its eyes, and I know I must betray it. How many minutes are left? Two? No. Okay, so I'll read two more. And <clears throat> Roasting meat by the roadside. Sorry, vegetarians. We are roasting a chunk of tenderloin beef outside, my older brother, my younger sister, and someone who looks familiar. He could be David from my high school. He laughs like David and talks like David. He's supposed to be telling us stories. He says he has good ghost stories. This place where we are is new to me. I do not remember living or moving here Yet, I have that orange apartment across the road. Other than a few shrubs and very short, scanty trees, the rest is sand and concrete. This is a city, but what city? Why aren't we in a park or some other picnic-friendly place instead of the roadside? A few meters from our roasting place, we see a lion coercing three lambs. The lion tells them that he knows a place with green pastures where they all can feed to their fullest. They believe the lion and walk with it. We know he's going to eat them. I gather some sticks to beat the lion in case it comes back for us. I am the age I am now, so is my brother, but my young sister, who should be 34 years, is only a baby. We make her sit between me and my brother. David is not with us anymore. When the beef is done, I suggest we take it to my apartment and eat our lunch from there. That way we will avoid the lion. I get the keys out of my jacket pocket, and my brother carries the beef. Then we cross the road. Okay. So this last piece is, okay, I won't say anything about it. Let me just read. In winter, Basil fights for dear life, then succumbs. The horse hair worm is a grave danger to the house cricket. 
It leads the insect on a suicide mission, propels it to leave the safety of land and jump into the sea. Invasion of the body is not enough. The warm mind controls the insect, tricks it into thinking it's an other and drives it into water, which is natural for the worm, but deadly to the host. Then the worm escapes by boring holes through the insect's exoskeleton. When I lived in Senegal, there were abundant stories and images of youths jumping into pirogues and attempting to cross the Atlantic, precipitated by skyrocketing unemployment, hoping to become an other in greener pastures abroad. Young men and women who didn't go by pirogue traversed the desert teeming with as many dangers as the sea. Those who made it to the electrified wall, Spain or France on their mind, Libya in the way. Those who made it to the wall began to climb, hope in their sweaty palms, each in hell and exhale, commingling with peril and possibility until the guards started shooting. I would like to believe that there was a moment the whiff of freedom touched their nostrils like a baby's finger. Before they fell, I like to imagine that they breathed the opposite of capture. As they dangled on that wall, they had a fierce image of themselves into, into which all their body cells and pounding hearts crystallized and transcended the sum of their fears. Raised above themselves, I would like to believe they died whole, even as their bodies were blown apart, pieces of arms, fingers, feet and bones splintered and scattered. I hope they did not have a second to question or comprehend what worm had driven them to such despair. I hope they pressed their tongues and crossed their lips and licked their blood like hunters do to fortify their palate. I hope they looked up into the numinous sky and saw the face of God calling them home, parting a cloud, saying, at last, home, enter. And that's how they died. Thank you. I'm going to read a few pages from uh, a book I've been working on for a long time. It's set in 1929, uh, just down the mountain, uh, a little bit east of here in Bessemer City, North Carolina, and Gaston County, North Carolina. It's about a mill strike, and this is just um, a, few, a few pages from the opening, opening chapter. They'd been crossing this very field the first time Ella had laid eyes on Charlie Shope. He'd catcalled her from the back of a Model T flatbed as it rumbled past on the King's Mountain Highway. It had been three months ago in early February, the weather cold and damp, the sky was white. The man's legs were covered over with a blanket, his feet dangled off the back of the truck, a battered suitcase set beside him, an old guitar rested on his lap. Ella and Violet watched him get smaller and smaller as the distance between them and the truck grew. He tipped his hat and blew a kiss, and then he was gone. They walked in silence for a moment. What in the hell was that, Ellard finally said. That was a white man in a truck, Violet said. I know that, Ella said. Who's he think he's whistling at? You, white girl. Violet forced out a laugh. You think he's hollering at me? Shoot. How you know he's whistling at me? Violet had stopped walking, had stared at Ella. Then she looked behind her in the direction of Stumptown, where a few roofs were visible on the far side of the hill. She looked toward the forest on their right, the leafless trees wispy in the distance. Then she turned her eyes to the road where the truck had just passed. The air was cold, it smelled of wood smoke. Their noses ran. What in the world else was he whistling at? Violet asked. She took a handkerchief from her pocket, blew into it. I don't know, Ella said. I'm just trying to mind my own business. Violet smiled and put the handkerchief back inside her pocket. Come on, girl, she'd said. We're going to be late. Neither one of us can afford that. This world ain't going to pay you in whistles. The second time Ella saw Charlie Shope was the very next night in a spinning room at the mill. He sidled up to her where she worked on the, sh on the line, took off his hat, held it over his heart. He was small, not much taller than her. I seen you yesterday, he said, his voice barely reaching over the noise of the machines, crossing the field with that colored girl. 
Ella acted like she didn't hear him, kept her eyes on her work. He leaned toward her, cupped a hand around his mouth. I seen you yesterday, he hollered. Ella looked up as if she'd realized that someone had just spoken to her. Yes, yeah, she said, you saw me? Good for you. Yeah, he said, you seen me? Ella stepped aside so the Doffer girl could pass through with the cart full of spindles. You seen me out there on the road, he said. If I seen you, I don't remember it, Ella said. She went back to her empty, empty spindles, worked down the line, and he followed. I just got to town, just got set up to this job, he said, but you seen me. You remember me. If I remember you, I done forgot you already. That's okay, he said. We got all the time in the world to get acquainted. I'm going to marry you. Ella laughed and looked over at him, noted the greasy cowlick he'd smeared down on his forehead. I already had me one husband, she said. Took me 11 years to run him off, and I ain't got that kind of time anymore. <laughs> all right, honey, he said. She fought a smile. I heard the foreman's heading this way, she said. You better go on. You don't want to get fired your first night on the job. Hell, he said, it'd be worth it if you keep talking. What's your name? Busy, she said. <laughs> okay, Busy, he said. I'm Charlie, Charlie Shope. But here soon, you'll just be calling me sweetheart. The third time she laid eyes on him was five nights later when his face had appeared on the other side of the line again. You know Mose, he'd asked, the old color man down in the opening room? I've seen him before, Ella said. She moved down. He followed her. He just took his break, Charlie said, went out for a smoke and a nip with the boys. I spent all week saving up a quarter dollar to get him to be stay gone a few extra minutes. Ella laughed. Takes a disciplined man to save that much money, she said. You can tease, he said, but it'd be the best quarter dollar you ever spent. You ain't getting no money out of me. I ain't asking you for money, he said, just a little time, and we ain't got much of it left. Ten minutes later, she found him in a dark corner of the opening room, hunkered down between huge mounds of raw cotton. He stood when he saw her, and then he smiled and let his body fall back as if he'd been shot. You've never experienced such comfort, he said. Ella could barely see him in the near dark, just a shattered space with eyes and teeth sunk into all that white cotton. She laughed when he coughed, picked a stem from his mouth, flicked it toward the floor. He reached up for her. She took his hand, allowed herself to be pulled down toward him, allowed him to kiss her, to run his hands up and down her back, through her hair. Afterward, he climbed out of the cotton and lit a cigarette. He drew on it and then held it out to her. She stood dusted the cotton from her dress, smoothed back her hair, pinned it into a bob at the nape of her neck. You ain't supposed to be smoking in here, she said. There's a lot of things you ain't supposed to do in here, he said. Well, that's all you're getting from me, she said. Well, that's enough. I suspected you for a rule breaker first time I seen you, Ella said. See, Charlie said, I knew you'd seen me. I just remember some fool whistling like a hobo from the back of a truck. He reached out and brushed the cotton lint from her dark hair. You're pretty, he said, and you're a damn liar. He laughed. You're sweet, too, and you're a damn liar, she said again. Thank you. So as if you didn't know, that was Wiley Cash. I don't think, did you say your name? I don't know if I remember you said your name. And he's teaching fiction writing this semester. And next semester, he's going to work one-on-one -on -one with some fiction writing and prose writing students. I'm Rick Chess. I'm not teaching any creative writing this semester, but I have the really distinct pleasure of working with Melissa Sibley as her first reader on her senior thesis. And in the spring, I'm teaching a class called Poetry and Spirituality in the Honors Program. And before I read a couple of things, I just want to announce um, one of three readings that are coming Coming up in the next two weeks. This one on November 14th by Yahushua November. Um, his new book is called Two Worlds Exist. He happens to be a Hasidic Jew. He's an incredible poet. One of his poems was reprinted in the New York Times Sunday Magazine just a couple of Sundays ago, and there are flyers over on that table. After hearing that a friend visiting Israel for the first time asked her private tour guide, where is the Garden of Eden? Where is the Garden of Eden? Can I see it from the hotel east facing room on the 18th floor? Does the 18 bus stop there? My children, I think, they must have grown up in the Garden of Eden while I was away with work, 18-hour nights and days. 
Look, their radiant faces. Listen, their voices, sweet rivers on which I afloat drift. When I was 18, I was invited to love for the first time. But before I arrived at the Garden of Eden, I spilled what I was given to deliver. My friend who presented herself to me that night in my childhood bedroom smiled, took my hand, and led me to the mirror to admire our bodies reflected. She was patient, reassuring, wise. Did she think we would find the Garden of Eden in the mirror, its honey dripping, its hive alive with bees? Finally, we fell back into bed in the dark. Even if it was only 18 seconds, it was real. <laughs> Almond balm, evergreen breeze, the garden of all my dreams. 18 days, or was it 18 months or 18 years? How long my recovery from first, second, third love, loss of the garden. I'm married now 18 years for life. Marriage is not Eden, where nothing is broken, shattered, bent, destroyed. Nothing to forget, nothing to recall. But there are moments when there is nothing more perfect than my wife's complaints about her day. The 18 ants that crawled on her legs while she played on a filthy floor in Hidden River Trailer Park with a two-and-a-half-year-old boy trying to get him to say P and B as in pop, boom. Do you remember the Garden of Eden, I ask her, and I wait, and I listen all night, even long after she has fallen asleep? and I am lying beside her as beside the river that waters the garden on its way out of Eden, where it splits four ways and spills into children's lives. The Book of Brothers. So uh, from a girl's point of view, Torah, which is uh, in its narrowest definition, the five books of Moses, probably seems like a story that doesn't have much of interest for them. It's a story about a lot of brothers. And so this poem uh, is sort of imagining um, how sisters regard this book that they call the Book of Brothers. Reading it, the Book of Brothers, the sisters are by turns amused, appalled, and bored. Those boys, they think. To read about themselves, the sisters should listen to the turning page of the sea, should turn to the page of blood. Their darkness knows how life pushes through to light, but the sisters are taught to read the good book, the only book for them, the book of brothers. And what is its first letter, its first lesson? Bet, that's the Hebrew letter, bet. The letter for bait, house. See, they are told, this is your house. Make it home, a home for your brothers and you. The sisters understand. Until the book of sisters is discovered, the sisters read but resist the book of brothers. Their lives are Torah too, but told in a holy language, boys will never wholly understand. And this last very short poem with like a little bit of an introduction, it's called Mezuzah. It's the poem um, from which the title for my, I'm very happy to say this, my forthcoming book that will probably be out in the spring. Uh, the title comes from this poem. Um, a mezuzah is a small case. It could be metal, it could be wood, it could be glass, attached to the doorpost of a house, of a room that contains a little scroll with some scripture inside it. And the scripture includes a passage from Deuteronomy that says, you shall 
shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, etc., etc. Um, so mezuzah, a really short poem, also with two epigraphs. Tell all the truth but, and that's from Dickinson, and then You Shall Love from Deuteronomy. And I'm gonna read this poem exactly the way it's lineated so it won't sound like natural speech. It'll sound a little awkward and artificial. For each of the moods of marriage, the small lies that keep our lives whole as we cross the threshold passing, the commandment to love nailed slant to the doorpost. Thank you. Hello, my name is Evan Gurney and uh, I teach a poetry writing workshop. Uh, for the creative writing department. Many of my brilliant students are here this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Uh, when I'm not teaching or reading or writing, I um, am usually out fishing, um, fly fishing for trout, um, not because I'm very good at it, but because um, if you're fly fishing for trout, you're usually in a beautiful place. Uh, my favorite place to fish is up in the balsam range um, and it's the headwaters of the Pigeon River, which is a bit of a contradiction, um, because as you keep following the river downstream, you reach Canton, North Carolina, um, home to a, an enormous paper mill, which pollutes the river from then on. It's a poem about that. A Blaze. It's just past noon on the headwaters of the Pigeon River, the spine of Fork Ridge stretched out behind me, all green and golden in the sunlight, the hills rejoicing on every side. And I've been catching brook trout since late morning, the silly darlings almost leaping into my hands, their sides passionately ablaze beneath their vermiculate patterns. Perhaps a prick of hunger sends them to a hare's ear or yellow sally with their hidden barbs. Or maybe they think we live in a world far kinder than we do. Their gaping mouths speak parables. Follow the water downstream and you'll slide below gorges wreathed by laurel and rhododendron to Lake Logan, where champion lumber, done trimming the forest of its timber, flooded sunburst. Keep going north, as I will at dusk, and you'll flatten out just past Bethel. The river widens slows down, its purling eddies keep turning back to the south, like a man who doesn't want to get where he's going. And up ahead you see the stacks of Blue Ridge paper, belching golden steam. The sky glows, the river glows, and when the peaks that rise up behind are lit with sundown, it looks like the mill, the town, the mountains, the whole world is on fire. One of the challenges I pose to my poetry writing students is to write a, a fixed form of some kind, um, a sestina or a guzzle or a villanelle. And so I figured it's only fair that I write one myself. So this is a villanelle. One of the most famous villanelles is Dylan Thomas's uh, Do Not Go Gently Into That Good Night. Um, this is a kind of thought experiment on my part to um, write a similar kind of poem. Our hands go separate ways. We shake hands before I go, and he stays. We'll see each other next I don't know when. A month, a year, our hands go separate ways. We've always relied on this manual phrase, handshakes and high fives, men speaking like men. We shake hands, then one goes, the other stays. Years past, I studied how to earn his praise, avoid his blame, or hope he'd count to 10. A palm, a fist, our hands go separate ways. The sins of fathers, can they be erased? And when sons are fathers, what happens then? We'll shake hands, of course, then go or stay. No patience for my books or essays, he gripped a scalpel rather than a pen. In life, in work, our hands go separate ways. 
But now his fingers are palsied and gray. Let us fold them in prayer ever, amen. A week, a day, our hands go separate ways. A blessing before he goes, so I stay. Then another kind of family poem. I was um, looking at a uh, poetry journal which was explicit in its submission guidelines, uh, no poems about children. <laughs> and so in um, righteous indignation, I penned a sonnet and sent it to the journal. And they rejected it. <laughs> All this love. Another late night working, and I find you all asleep when I walk up the stairs. The boys have shimmied into lamb and lion pajamas, brushed their teeth, said their prayers, and fallen into dreams of digging sand. Legs akimbo, arms flailing, they're at work even now. You're at work too, dear, arms fanned out among quilts and pillows in the dark, as if you were harvesting the room's stillness. You three are so much your own in this sleep. Sometimes I'm frightened by this fullness. I wonder how, in all this love, I can keep a hold on you, and if that's even right. Still, I ask, please make room for me tonight. Thank you. Um, I'm David Hopes. I'm teaching a, a, a playwriting workshop now. I see a couple of my brilliant students here. Um, and next semester I'll be teaching senior seminar and poetry writing, so come on. And it's the 1st of November and I'm wearing a luau shirt. Um, I'm putting together my um, journals from travels in Ireland into a book of essays. And I'm going to read an excerpt from the first the first time I ever uh, sat down in, in Ireland, which was, God help me, 1980. Um, the essay is called uh, 30 Hours Without a Rest. I had researched both deeply and not at all. That is to say, I knew the histories and the lines of kings, but I did not know there were buses you could take from Shannon Airport anywhere you wanted, and that anyone could ride them without asking embarrassing questions that would show right off you were a tourist. I wanted to be an Irishman. <clears throat> I wanted to strike out down the road right off as though I were aiming for the home place and nothing could stop me. I'd flown Air Canada, so the Air Canada tags dangling from my backpack gave me at least a moment's camouflage. I doubted people had so many ready assumptions about Canadians as they did about Americans. But oh God, I was American through and through. And more than that, an American poet. I would loaf and invite my soul. I would wander through the Irish countryside, absorbing everything, editing nothing, a pint-sized Whitman with Air Canada tags taking it all in, giving it all out again in poetry. Half the weight of my backpack was a giant dust-blue ledger book in which I would write my poems. I, stuck, I struck out on foot down the road from the airport. A man in a lorry picked me up. I couldn't understand a word he said. He looked like my grandfather. He, dropped, he uh, dropped me on the road, as I motioned him to do, just north of Gort. Here's a snapshot of me walking alongside the road like someone who knows where he's going, the whole time scanning for road signs, the line of a noble roof, a bar with a shamrock in the window, anything to show the window, to show the way. Here is the snapshot of me being looked at from the windows of passing cars. They're making signs I do not understand. Me smiling and grinning my big American grin, sweating under my gaudy American backpack, assured somehow that all will be right. In Ireland, I, it is Ireland I have come home. It has got to be all right. The old man in the lorry that brought me from Shannon called me dear. I couldn't understand what he was saying when he was not calling me dear. He told me which side of the road to stand on if I wanted to ride, and that when drivers made hand signs in the car, they were telling you which way they're going, and you were meant to talk, nod or turn away to tell them yes or no. I say yes every time. I don't know where I'm going. I'd go wherever they took me. I told him that, and he said, I know that by looking at you, and that is a danger. <laughs> the old man left me. I didn't know which way to go, so I just stood until my second ride came, a businessman who had lived in San Francisco, to whose weather he compared this salty blast from the sea. He is a Gaelic speaker and taught me to say police station and thou art my dearest dear. 
His first words to me were, Guten Morgen, though, supposing that my blonde hair and my determined air that I was German. Where are you going? I'm going to Cool Park. You're on the right road, then. Were you thinking to walk all the way? I don't know. Ireland's a small country. He laughs, <laughs> he laughs and says, that it is. He drives a minute and says, would you like some company? Cool, I mean. Sure I would. The fact is, though, I do not want company. Not right now. I want to be wild and lone and discover things as I thought they were the first traveler, as though I were the first traveler ever. But the man is kind. We turn off the Galway Road onto the road to Cool. I see yet another house with stone griffins in front, guarding the drive from whatever might come out of the seven woods. I see long walls of stone dividing one field from its identical twin. The trees are flattened at the top by a great wind coming perpetually from the gray Atlantic. The man sees me watching so intently and says, It's great to come to a new world, isn't it? Even if it's an old one. The man asks my name and I tell him. Immediately he turns it into Davy. Nobody has called me Davy in 20 years. I let him. I worked as a naturalist in part of the life I had got before I got on the plane. I started naming the trees of the roadside for him, and the man was impressed. Oak, plain, laurel, monkey puzzle. Monkey puzzle? Is that what you call that? It's a very odd name. It's a very odd tree. You're naming them to make them your friends, so they'll remember you when you come back. He was exactly right. The man pulls the car into the parking lot. I start assembling myself for the next leg of the journey. You don't have to take your backpack, then. But I do, in case the man and I wish to part ways sooner than we think we do. Where's the house, I say? Where's Lady Gregory's house? There is no house, lad. They pulled it down years ago for the sake of the stone. I am dumbfounded. I follow him to the dappled shade. The signs of the path point to places with names I know from poems, and the man takes one of them. The forest is beautiful, but also young, maybe three or four times older than I. I picture an old woman in black kneeling in the loam, planting the trees in the mist of a morning early in this century. I picture Lady Gregory looking like she looks on the money, straight she used to be on the on the pound note, the Irish pound note, uh, straightening herself and walking back for tea with Yates and Singh in the house that is gone. The inner trees are tall and thin, crowded trees of a crowded forest. At the edge of the forest, the trees are vast and ancient, older maybe than the house that is gone. Men are hurling in an open field. Hurling, by the way, is, they're not ill. It's a game. All right. Men are hurling in the open field. I can see their bodies through the forest, disappearing and reappearing as they pass behind the trees. The man takes a side path. There's a heavy scent of wild garlic. It is pleasant, but it makes me hungry. The path leads down, and before us is the rippling gray water of the lake. I see by the lake's face that strong winds tear at it, but where we are, it is calm, a cup between tree-crowned ridges. A white horse runs in the far field. He startles a swan out of cover, maybe the descendant of Yeats's nine and fifty from so long ago. The man says, this is a place for a rest, lad, and helps me off with my backpack. I know what is coming. He keeps crooning facts about the estate to me in case I'm apprehensive or in case we read each other wrong. But I'm not apprehensive. I'm tired, but also glad that things should begin like this, that I should be invited beneath the surface almost at once. I smell myself, fearing that after the long journey I may offend the man, but it's all right. And when he nuzzles me, he makes no complaint. I think what we are doing between the gray stones almost makes up for the great gray houses being gone. I think maybe it's his gift to me to make up for the disappointment, or our gift to the park for, for being bereft of the house that made it. When we are finished, he says, do you need to ride back to town? No, I think I'll linger here a while. He looks hard at me. He knows I'm making a mistake. I'm shrugging off friendship, almost the first thing. I could say that's the way I am, but maybe with all the fierceness of looking, he knows already. I'm afraid that I won't see everything if I fall in love. Dressing, he could not find his white undershirt, his vest, his, his vest, he called it. When he was gone, I saw it a few yards away, where it had been tossed in a moment of eagerness. I picked it up, shimmied out of my own stained dress shirt, and put it on. It was cool, and then it was warm, very much warmer than it should have been, as though part of the kind man were still in it. Then it was I went down to the water and counted the swans. I sat with my enormous notebook in my hands and wrote. I wrote a poem in the place where Yeats had been, leaning against this very rock, maybe. I considered my vocation as a poet. I should have nothing else in my mind, but finally, I'm just too cold sitting there. The pen vibrates in my hand, and the letters on the pages are unreadable. This seems a defeat to me. Even if, even if I finish the poem some other time, it won't be the same. 
The men are still hurling when I get to the field, though there are fewer of them, just four or five running about slashing the air with their sticks and shouting. They are having the most fun in the world. I look at the signature tree. I buy postcards in the shop where the house used to be. I trudge up the road feeling, for the first time, 30 hours without a rest. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori Horvitz. Um, I'm teaching senior seminar this semester, um, and I have an 80% pr present rate today, since I have four out of the five here. Um, next semester, I'm teaching um, creative nonfiction workshop, and um, if you've already taken it, you can take it again. I'm teaching all new books. So also, I want to mention next Tuesday at this time, this place, Lucy Corin, who's a fiction writer, um, is, will be here giving a reading. So you should all come. There's flyers over there for um, both readings that uh, Rick mentioned and Lucy Corin. So this piece is called My Father's Mug. I have to take my glasses off for it, I think. Um, I actually wrote this piece this past June. Um, it, it, um, if you're familiar with the Moth podcast, um, they have a moth every month, once a month, at the Moth Light here. And the theme of the night was fathers. So I wrote this, and I actually performed it. And you pe pe people get up there. They have five minutes, and they have to tell a story without notes. I have notes today, so I'm not going to. Last time I visited my father in New York, the first thing he did was insist I take a coffee mug back home with me. Take the cup, he said. It's a beautiful cup. <laughs> he had donated money to a charity and received the mug as a thank you gift. Over and over he repeated himself, it's a very nice cup. Wheeling his walker behind me, he said, you should take it. It's not unusual for my father to repeat himself. He's always been anxious and obsessive, and once he gets on a roll, he can't stop. In the past, some of his obsessions were downright sadistic. When I was a lonely teenager, every now and then he'd say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have any friends? He offered me $5 to call a friend, knowing full well I had no one to call. I've since tried to humor him. When he said it again, you need to take the cup. I started to lose my patience. I only have a carry-on bag. Besides, I have plenty of mugs at home. But it's a nice cup. <laughs> Finally, he maneuvered his way into an easy chair and picked up his iPad to check the stock market. My father is 88, and his back is twisted and hunched over, and he could barely walk. He br it breaks my heart to see him struggling like that. Yet while growing up, I was terrified of him. Every so often, his face would turn beet red, and he'd scream at me and my siblings, and we'd hide in, back, in the back of closets, under beds, behind the dirty laundry. Now he asks, so how are you? What's going on with you? I never talk about my romantic life with my father, although after meeting my college boyfriend, he did give me his assessment. Good vocabulary, ugly as sin. <laughs> 10 years later, when I was in grad school, he said, send grandma a recent photo of yourself. She wants to set you up, a, up with a police sergeant. He's Jewish. And one day he asked, don't you ever meet any men? No doubt the subtext was, are you a lesbian? Now he looks up from his iPad and says, how's that woman from Madison? Earlier in the year, I had told him about a girlfriend from Madison, although I didn't use the word girlfriend, but he knew. I even showed him pictures of us together. I mentioned her because my father grew up in Madison, and while I was there, I visited his childhood home. The home where his mother told him he wasn't smart enough to get into college, where his army colonel father called him a moron, where his parents fought with each other from morning till night. I asked him what he did when his parents fought. I sat in the closet, he said, and read the dictionary. Now I look at the white-haired man in front of me. Never the most supportive of parents. When I told my father about my upcoming trip to Mexico, he said, you don't need to be going to Mexico shitting all day long. Why don't you go to Epcot Village? You'd love it. <laughs> when I got accepted to a PhD program, he said, stop with the school already. Just get a job in an advertising agency. And when I mentioned I was reading Marx for a class, he said, you don't need to be reading Marx. He was a filthy bastard who never took a bath. During my first semester teaching college, a colleague wrote a glowing teaching observation. 
I showed it to my father, figuring since he worked as a school teacher, he would appreciate it, maybe even be proud of me. But instead, he looked up and said, this is beautifully written. Where did this woman go to school? <laughs> My father taught middle school social studies in Queens, New York. Most of his students were African American. One of my earliest memories, my father took me to his class the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. He talked about the civil rights movement and King's impact on it, and together he and his students sang, We Shall Overcome. A few students wiped tears from their faces. On the morning of my departure, again my father said, Take the cup. It's a very nice cup. And so I took the cup. I snapped a photo of him, a big grin on his face, holding up the cup. Yes. What I didn't say before, he donated money to the Human Rights Campaign, the largest national LGBTQ civil rights organization, and they sent him the mug as a thank you gift. It's a nice cup. It's a deep blue with HRC's equality logo embossed on it. Before leaving for the airport, I bent down to hug my father. Finally, I heard in my head those words he could never say aloud, I'm proud of you. Um, we have 10 minutes, and um, we talked about maybe if people had questions for any of us, so maybe if you all want to come up. Um, and if people had questions for any of us about the writing program, our classes, our own writing. You go for it. <laughs> Questions? Come on. Be the brave one to start. Yes? Um, I have a question about finding the right, right words to like structure a thought or like structuring like, I don't know how to explain it, but like find the right kind of language to get, to convey. Okay, she asked, how do we find the right language to convey our thoughts? Anybody want to <laughs> tackle that? I like English. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a question for the poets, maybe, especially. I don't start with thoughts, so any words that come may start pointing me in the right direction of the words that I'll find out are the right words. Um, so I, I really don't start with any ideas in mind. Maybe that question reveals, I, I don't know if you have a problem with that, but, but the question makes it sound like it's intentional, and it's not. And if it is intentional, then you're doing it wrong. If you're sitting there and you're, you're actively looking, how do I do this? You just open, you just open your mouth and listen to what you're saying. Because you can really get in your own way by wondering if you're starting out the right way. Just mm -hmm. start writing it down, don't edit it, you know, edit it later. But you know, <laughs> don't, don't have that problem. You know, don't worry about that. Just open your mouth and speak. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I would agree. I would agree with what what Dr. Hopes just said. Like, you know, when you're sitting down to write, you, you have to think about like, what mood am I in, and, and how do I feel, and kind of go from there. And then when you go back to edit, try to recall that mood and ask if the language on the page reflects that mood. You know, what is the mood of the piece? You know, if you're trying to write something somber, but your piece is you know, full of irony and sarcasm and wit, it's not, you know, reflective of what you're trying to do. Okay, any questions? Yeah. yeah this is a really difficult question. Could you, each of you say who your favorite writer is and then maybe like a sentence why? He asked if each of us could tell us who our favorite, could, could say who our favorite writer is and why. Oh, it changes. It depends on what I'm reading at the moment. Right now, I think my favorite writer would be Octavia Butler, but that's because I'm reading science fiction and I'm not writing science fiction. <laughs> if you ask me one month down the road, it's going to be another writer. Today it's Yates. Hmm. I'd say collectively it's the rabbis and their midrashic imagination. Probably Alice McDermott or Ernest Gaines. Um, I would say my favorite book is Housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson. So, did I get yours? No, uh. but, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I um, uh, probably Sir Thomas Brown, an eclectic writer from the 17th century. Well, that's so cool. 
<laughs> All right. I know who that uh, is too. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> so when you um, are writing something and it's just frustrating, like not what you want to write, how do you muster the resolve to just keep going with it, and no matter like how discouraging it looks on the paper? So the question was, um, when we're writing and we're really frustrated, and how do we keep going? What keeps us going? Anybody? Nothing. I throw it out. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Lane? If you're working, <laughs> if you're working too hard, you do it wrong. Yeah. Or just, or just put it to the side. That that Villanelle that uh, I, and I don't know that it's finished or perfect or anything like that. But I, I started it ten years ago, and. Um, uh, now it's finally come to fruition. I put it aside for about nine and a half years, and uh, that, that was the time it needed to ripen. It's interesting. We talked about this in the senior seminar last week about revision and you know how how we could look at something differently. And one of the things um, someone said is if you put it in a different font, mm -hmm. you see it differently, like literally and figuratively. Um, also, you could put it from a different point of view. I'm just saying that if you have to have something tomorrow and you hate it, uh, but put it away is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No. Um, any questions? Yeah, this one back of Lane. Yeah. Um, sort of the same day. What's the worst kind of? What's the? What's your either least favorite writer or the worst thing that you've read? Describe it for us in a single vicious sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the worst writing. Describe it in a vicious sentence, the worst writing we've read. <laughs> the worst. Gosh. I can't remember. Gertie, the bongos one. Yeah, yeah. I just shared, a, um, this is a terrible thing to do to a workshop group, um, but I shared uh, with my students the worst poem I'd ever, I'd ever seen composed. Um, by when I was an undergraduate in, in a workshop group with a student who was high, and brought in bongos, and, oh, God. and um, uh, um, it, it was deliciously awful. <laughs> yeah, going off on that note, I've seen more than my share of, well, the narrator's tripping, so they don't know what they're doing anyway, so. <laughs> or the narrator's insane, so there's no accountability. In <laughs> yeah. <that>. <laughs> <laughs> So are you all talking about student writing? Yeah. No, <laughs> colleague writing. Colleague writing. From grad school especially. <laughs> One time my mom had a friend who is um, considerably older than her, self-published a novel, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was, I used to read it out loud in, in, in my workshops just for like comic relief, and it sounds terrible, it's terribly mean, but there was a scene where a man is trying to romance, like rekindle romance with his wife so they go on a cruise and they have like this uh, big romantic dinner like in their, in their stateroom and he puts rose petals all over the bed and then she knows for certain what he's up to when he puts Kenny G on the CD player. And I'm just reading it out loud thinking, oh, this is so terrible and so awkward. I went to a reading by a really famous poet, Warren Wilson. Came away thinking it was the worst thing I ever heard. I will not say the name, but I will, I will improvise a poem by this person. I'm driving home, there's a stop sign the stop sign is an octagon. Oh, octagon. I think the pedals are there, the stop and the go. <laughs> Was it James Franco? No. No. <laughs> no, no. Might have been, but was not. Anybody else? Oh, it's back to the think of the worst writing. Because I'm thinking the worst writing is where you learn nothing. Mm, where sure. you take away nothing. But even like just hearing what you've shared, it's like, I'm actually laughing. So maybe that's not the worst thing. <laughs> I think anything that makes you laugh or smile, maybe it has some its purpose. So the worst is where you have nothing whatsoever to take away. Mm -hmm. That's good. One more question. Uh, OK. Well, maybe two, because, yeah. Um, when you have like blocked out of time for writing, or you know you're about to start writing, is there any particular thing that you, like music you listen to, or a place you go, or anything you do that kind of gets you into writing mode? So we're in the, when we're in the mood for writing, <laughs> when that, when it, we get struck by inspiration, <laughs> what do we put on Kenny G or Jimi Hendrix? No, um, what do we do? Uh, is that what the, was that the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, 
Four o'clock in the morning, complete silence. I don't wait for the mood. I try to write whenever I have the opportunity to. So, um, I never really feel like writing. It's work. It's like a job to me. It's like drilling holes in sheet metal or digging holes for a fence. And so I have to go to work. I run an office where we live in Wilmington, and I go to work and I leave my phone in the car. I don't have internet, and I work. You know, I don't really have moods or inspiration. I kind of just put one word in front of the other and hope it's not too too terrible. <laughs> In complete silence, and um, uh, I, I, whenever I get a chance, I'll, I'll sit down and, and sort of um, go to work. Um, God, if I waited for the mood, I'd never. <coughs> yeah, and same with me. I mean, when I do write, it's in the morning, starting out with a cup of coffee and getting antsy. So, <laughs> but, but, but writing is like going to the gym. There, there are three things you're, 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 you can do that you'll never regret. Writing, working out, or taking a nap. <laughs> You've never done one of those three things and been like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, so you'll never, you'll never regret that. Yeah. Okay, one more question. You. Okay. I just think it's always interesting when people write, um, read what they've written and it's in a younger point of view. Um, why do you think a lot of us write um, going back to that teenage time in our lives. Okay, so the question is why do um, a lot of writers go back to that time of like a teenager or a young child in our lives? You're never not that person. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. And I, th I think writing. I think, <laughs> I think writing's about discovery, and we want to read things about people discovering things. And it's hard to write about adults discovering things in, in a in a in an honest way. And I think when you can go back and write from a child's perspective or appeal to your own sense of childhood, you're able to achieve some sort of innocence or some sort of curiosity that you can't really attain again as an adult with a, with an adult's knowledge. And, and writing from a child's perspective, there's always the moment where you're going to know something you can't unknow. And it's hard to write with that in mind as an adult. And we'll end there. Um, so everybody, thanks for coming out. Thanks for the readers. Um, and yay. <laughs>